Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Well, you know, Blake, it seems like every time we go and take a week off, it feels like life just happens. Lots of life just happens. Yeah, lots of life just happens. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, it is episode 134. Today is July 1st, 2019. You're listening to or maybe even watching on YouTube, Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Yes, indeed. Back in the saddle after there, what? Two yes, weeks? One we, week? Seven weeks? We only skipped one week. Eight months. But it's two weeks technically since our last show. So a half a month has passed. Goodness. And so know, much. You know what? We got some stuff to talk about today in the news. Uh, it's been a little bit slower of a news week, I, I, or I guess news month. Um, really, there hasn't been too much to talk about here, but we will talk about researchers developing a sensing system to constantly track the performance of workers and the, you know, sort of the ethical uh, ramifications yeah, of such there's tracking. A, there's <laughs> some ethics involved with that. MIT's new in, interactive machine learning prediction tool could give everyone AI superpowers. Finally. Um, Alexa's listening. So, <laughs> again, sorry to activate any of your uh, in-home devices. He's not sorry. Uh, an experimental tool warns of cardiac arrest by monitoring breathing. Uh, and then, also, we also have... Uh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> we did have a fourth story, but we scrapped it. Uh, okay, but Blake, we are back in the saddle. There's a lot that's been going on. I want to know what's going on with you, because you had, uh, is it fair to say, a new addition in your Absolutely, life? Absolutely, yeah. So... Recently, Elise and I adopted a puppy, so it's been hilarious trying to figure out and navigate like having a new dog because it's been like ten years since I've gotten a new puppy. So it's right. been it's been fun for me because um, it's just been me and the pup for a couple of weeks while Elise was on vacation. And one thing that I found really interesting for for me as a dog owner is okay. So now I've swapped my schedule at work, so I come in later and I leave later, so I can spend more time with the dog. But there was this, like, daunting experience that I had to figure out if I was going to do, which was, like, getting a dog walker through an app like WAG. Okay. So, okay. So, WAG is this dog walking app. So, what does that mean, dog yeah, walking? So it's basically just, it's kind of a software as a service thing, right? Like, it right. connects you, the user, with somebody that walks dogs or somebody like that either... Uber for dogs. Basically, yeah. It's kind of the same thing. Okay. Now, I... I didn't have a whole lot of context for this application. I hadn't used it before. I actually walked dogs for WAG when I was freelancing at one point. Okay. So I had used it before as a walker, but I don't. I didn't really know anybody else that did it. And I went through this entire process of, I'm kind of terrified to let somebody come and walk my dog. Well, it's a brand new pup. Yeah, like, it's a brand new dog. It's, it's brand new addition to your family. You're trusting somebody. Some with... stranger yeah. through an application that I've never met. But it, it couldn't be... A more like seamless experience like there's there's a lot of problems i think from some of the workflow aspects of the app but in terms of how like walk people that walk your dog or your animal interact with you like letting you know how the dog walk went sending you videos throughout it's like they've done a really good job on trying okay. to nail what kind of feedback you need to give a user in order to you know make them comfortable using this using the service so i have so many questions about this i i'm so curious like can you is it just for dogs, first off? Is it just for walking? Or is this like an all-inclusive service? Like, hey, you know, I want to leave my cats at home for a couple of days, and I need someone to go in and feed them. Is it like, hey, like, just show up. Here's a key. Uh, you open the thing and feed them this much and just, you know, like, verify with a picture and I'm good to go. Yeah, that I don't know. I know that some they've added to the service that they can... Like, basically, you know how you can board your dog or board sure, your yeah. animal? They'll do that at somebody's house, or they'll have okay. somebody come and pet sit at your house. So I'm assuming it's the same kind of deal. You would be able to, like, if you wanted them to feed your cats or feed your dog for a week right. or a day even, they'll have somebody that'll come and do that. Okay. Or, or you can book somebody to do that. And then it's kind of nice with the... Because, like, when you sign up for the app, it gives you an option. Do you want us to send you a free lockbox for your key to your house? So it's not like, you know sitting precariously under something like a doormat or whatever. Right. So they, they really had thought through the process end to end for sure. And like the UI itself is pretty, it's pretty stunning looking. There's still kinks in it, but it's, a, it's been a pretty fun process to go through. Right. So I'm interested in like the security aspect of this because you're letting a stranger into your home to like grab your dog. How, 
like what steps do you take to ensure like how what steps does first off the company take to ensure that the people who are coming to your house are not sketchy people yeah that's a good question i know they do a background check but what does that really mean right because you can do a simple background check on yourself on the internet and it doesn't cost very much or you can get an intensive one done by you know an employer or whatever and it's a completely different story yeah um so I don't really know from that perspective how much that does, but what I did, or the only thing that made me feel comfortable doing it is looking through and when they popped up a walker for me, right? it would show me a bunch of badges that are related to the walker. So I, the particular one that I have has done over 500 walks with dogs, you know, had different kind of gamification markers throughout. Okay. So it made me feel comfortable that they've been doing it as a service for a long time and nobody had like had their dog stolen by this particular person. No, but they've been pocketing, you know, from all these other houses without them knowing. Absolutely. Or... Could be. Totally could be. I mean, do you want to give your walker a shout out? Like, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, Is it no. the same walker every time or is it different? So for me, it has been because it turned out that a bunch of people that use the application like to walk dogs are actually professional dog walkers. So okay. like the first time somebody left me, left me their card and I was like, okay, well, I'll just use this one from now on. But the cool thing is, is because of like the feedback they give you about how the walk went, how they enjoyed like hanging out with the dog, they'll actually wag will allow you to assign this person as like a preferred walker. So every time I send out a request to have my dog walked, I can choose if it goes to this particular girl first. Okay. Um, versus just some rando that I don't know. Right. Okay. Well, that's kind of cool. It gives you that control. Yeah. It, it has a lot of like features in there that I wouldn't have expected it to, and it's grown over like the probably the year since I've used it. So it's pretty. Pretty scary, but they've done a pretty good job of getting around some of the, you know, scary issues of it. Now, who knows if people could be stealing stuff from your house, but I know right. a lot of people that use it. Um, they'll And actually, a, a coworker of ours does the same thing, but they have video cameras in the house. Yeah. So it's kind of like, imagine. You know, if you get caught doing that and you're, like, part of a service, you're probably going to get in a lot of shit. Yeah, I would imagine so. Like, uh, that'd be the thing. It's like, hey, you know, I've situated everything you need. The cat food's right up by the door, you know, or, or like the dog will come running to you and the leash is right by the door. So if you go anywhere else in the house, I'm going to know about it. Yeah. And me being the person that I am, like I've got a bunch of kind of fail safes for to know if like a door's been open that I had closed all day and that kind of yeah. stuff, just because I don't know these people. Now, I don't do it as much if I know that it's only going to be the specific girl that I use constantly because... Right. I mean, the first time that sh- I had her in, she stayed around and, like, played with my dog for 30 extra minutes, like, not charging me anything because she had, like, disconnected from the app. So oh, it, cool. it both terrified me because I was like, I don't know what this person is just doing in my house for an extra 30 minutes. And then it was, like, a delightful thing, too, because they took care of the dog over and above what it was right. expected. Yeah. It's, it's such a, like, kind of mixed bag, I think. I don't know. I, yeah, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Talk about privacy, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of cool because the my new apartment that we just moved into has actually got the Nest ecosystem built into it. Oh, cool! So I think I'll end up with those style cameras so you can watch it from home and all that stuff. Yeah, um, and it would make me feel more comfortable just like between having random walkers coming in the house to walk my dog, plus you just checking on checking in on him and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, that's cool. I'm 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 happy for your new addition. I cannot wait to meet them. Absolutely. I'll probably bring her to the office later in the week, but Please when Elise do. comes back, she'll definitely have him in the office more than more often because she actually has her own office. Yes, please do. Uh there there needs to be some pets. Absolutely. <laughs> so Nick, this is the long awaited banter section uh, for you. Yeah, it has been. So since uh the last time we met. So well, to cue everybody in. So last week, Monday, uh, I had just gotten back from Galaxy's Edge, and uh, I was dead tired. So that's one reason why the show wasn't here. Another reason was your pup yeah. um, needed to be taken care of. So life, like I said, gets in the way. And so we're back here. So now I'm here to tell you about Galaxy's Edge. Where do I start? Um, At the beginning. Okay. So let me, let me just kind of lay out the scene here. So Galaxy's Edge is the expansion to the Disneyland um Anaheim Resort, where um, you basically it, it's it's Star Wars land for all intents and purposes, and they've created this entirely new sort of area called uh, Black Spire Outpost on the planet of Batu, and it is situated kind of adjacent to Frontierland. It's kind of on the the eastern uh, the northeastern side of the park, um, and it's the largest expansion that has ever sort of happened to Disneyland. Um, and uh, so it's 14 acres of just Star Wars 14 acres? land. That's Star incredible. Wars land. 
Yeah. So um, I was fortunate enough. So so <laughs> some of the backstory here. I uh, we initially my partner and I we we were like, well, should we go? Maybe not. Maybe we'll wait for this. So only one of the two rides is open right now, um, which is the the flight of the Falcon, the Smuggler's Run. That's that the one that is open. That is open. Cool. The other one, Rise of the Resistance, does not open until later this year. And we were kind of saying, well, let's just wait and go. And both of them are open. Um, and you know, she's pregnant right now, so <laughs> that would she be, yeah. can't ride the rides. And so I was like, all right, well, you know, I want to experience it with her. And um, so anyway, the, what ended up happening was uh, our friends got us a a, a, a a they put our names down on the reservation. We said thanks, but no thanks. Um, other friends of theirs took our spots, and then we said, "Oh wait, maybe we we can go. We could just walk around and hang out." Oh no! What have we oh, done? Can we go? <laughs> oh, it's been taken by two other people. And then and then, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, they come back and say, "Okay, those other pe- two people dropped. You want to come?" We're like, "Yeah." So we, you know, asked one of our friends who works there, got us free tickets. We show up the day uh, their credit card machine wasn't working, so we got free parking. So already we're like. Already winning, yeah. We're geez. already winning by a whole lot. So um, the way these reservation systems work, now it's open to everyone that goes to Disneyland. You could stay the whole day there, but during the period of these reservations, you could stay there for four hours. Uh, and our block was 5 to 9 p.m. Um, so we spent the whole day at Disneyland, and then around 4 o'clock, we started lining up, uh, and they kind of like packed you all uh, in in on the resistance side of this outpost. Um, and... Uh, you know, you, you get in, and once you first get in, there's this John Williams symphonic suite that starts playing, um, and it's like, wow, that's Star Wars-y music. But once you get past that entrance, it's just full immersion to the point where you're hearing um, creatures, you're like in the bushes, and you're hearing sights and sounds and like data pad sounds and... Um, like I said, creatures and so it's much more like you're in universe. You're in universe. Like it's not like Star Wars music playing all the time. No, it's it's just you're in the universe. Um, so the first thing I did was kind of booked it straight to Savi's lightsaber building thing. So it's you basically build your own lightsaber, and uh, it's really cool. They go, <laughs> they go through this whole process uh, where you choose your kyber crystal. Um, you also sort of uh, choose what. First of all, you choose what components you want on your kyber crystal, or, or sorry, your lightsaber. And um, I'm trying to find the pictures so I can show you, Blake. I just had them up. Where'd they go? Uh, anyway, you you go through and pick which discipline you want. And you can pick from one of four things, and then each one has a different theme around it. And then once you've picked that, you can pick uh, sort of the kyber crystal as well as like all the bits and pieces that go into your lightsaber. Oh, sweet. So I picked the green kyber crystal and, um, you know, you, you basically build this piece by piece. They give you a tray of several different options, uh, that are all themed around the same thing. So, uh, I'll post a picture here on the YouTube version, at least of my finished lightsaber and some, uh, behind the scenes video that we took as well. Uh, and man, I, it's, it's really cool. So they take you through this whole thing. I dressed up too, by the way, like, of not, course you did not fully in costume, but like Star Wars ask, right? Cause Disneyland won't let you dress up. Um, oh, that's right. I always forget yeah. that little detail. So, uh, yeah, like it, it was really cool. So I was there, I was kind of in costume in universe and it's, it's really neat. The whole premise behind this thing is like, it's a junk trader. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I could go on and on about this, but I want to keep bringing this back to human factors. And the thing that they really nailed home here is immersion. Um, there are several things in the park. And if you don't want to be spoiled, like turn it off now or skip forward a couple minutes because uh, I'm going to go on about the immersion here. Um, but like I was saying, hinting at the uh, sights and sounds, it's not just sights and sounds. It's smells. Uh, so... Oh man, so trying to hit a bunch of senses at once. That's interesting. Do you ever wonder what a spaceport might smell like? No, I can't say that I have, but I'm assuming they figured it out. Oil and smoke, and uh, uh, also like there's a marketplace there, so they have like stuff's being cooked. uh, Yeah, so you get like kind of food and everything. So you get like cooked meat with uh, like engine fuel. Like it's just it smells like you're in Star Wars. Um, and 
you know, all the cast members are are in universe, right? They all have their own backstories. They'll talk to you and say, uh, down to like when you go to buy something, that will be thirteen point five three credits uh, instead of like instead of using like the dollars. dollars or, yeah. yeah. So they say credits that like it's really neat. It is really cool. Geez, so like everything from the visual, auditory, and even olfactory interactions you're having with the park are very Star Wars like. Even taste. So they've they've designed all these meals to be in universe, right? So you, you oh, can wow. have Endorian Yip Tip, which is like Endorian cuisine, uh, like stuff the Ewoks would eat, right? Or smoked kadu ribs. So those things that the Gungans might ride on, they they. Cook those, and they you eat can those eat the ribs. Die. Yeah, and I, of course, it's all real world Earth food. But um, so you think they've made it look like uh, you know in universe, and it's uh, here. I'll show you just a quick picture of it. Um, like they they make it look like it's in universe, so like it looks exotic without it's just different um, ingredients. So it's it's kind of cool. That's pretty amazing. That's kind of like how they did kind of the portion of what is it animal kingdom in orlando where it's like the avatar the avatar mark. stuff yeah yeah it's very very similar i think that must have been like a test bed for this type of thing um because yeah, they did an amazing job with that from yeah. the food to the, you, the probably the smells and everything are there too i just didn't notice it but definitely the sounds and everything like that as well so this is really that's really cool what else what else really struck you about the park that you were kind of surprised by or you weren't expecting going in because i knew you did a lot of research into this i and you did played the app before you even got to the park and all that kind of stuff i did so there were a bunch of issues with like merchandise and stock that disney kind of underestimated star wars fans and absolutely uh nothing was available by the time i went because i was in one of the last time slots before it was open to the public um but aside from that like i'm, I'm going to try to focus in on the human factor stuff here because that's that's what i think our listeners would find more interesting um and so some of the things that surprised me the immersion aspects of it and like i said not even just um the sights and sounds but the the design behind them was so natural so there were several moments and like i said if you don't want to be spoiled like this is minor spoilers it's environmental spoilers but whatever um skip ahead there there's several moments while i was in the park and i would hear like a spaceship take off and i would go and turn around and look and it was coming from a certain direction right it was coming from the spaceport and then there would be several moments where i hear a tie fighter overhead and i'd look up and i'd be where is it you know but uh, of course there's no tie fighter i'm in disneyland yeah, it's not like it's actually zooming past you. But like there, like several times, I was like, "There's a Tie Patrol overhead. I'm gonna look up, right?" And uh, it just fooled me every time. And man, it was crazy. That's pretty it's, insane. Yeah, it's wild, man. The the uh, uh, the there was um, so there's a there's the other type of thing that I want to talk about is just I didn't get as emotional as I thought I would where I did. Um, so. When we first got into the park, you know, there was not really time to soak it all in and be like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm in Star Wars. It's like I, I was kind of rushing to the lightsaber because you had to get there and put in your reservation or else you wouldn't be able to get to do it. Um, oh, OK. So I was kind of focused on that. Uh, and then we went and I saw the Falcon and I'm like, cool, I've seen this in pictures. It wasn't didn't really hit me. It was life size, a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, um, which it's kind of impressive to see in person. I would say so. I'd say that would probably be pretty impressive just to look at. But I especially got... if they've gone so far with the uh like the design of just the sound, I can only imagine like a real artifact. But really the the real thing was uh getting to fly it. Oh, that's wild. So was this on the ride or was this like within the thing that's kind of just hanging out in Galaxy's Edge on its own? This is the ride. Okay. So, so what happens is you go to this, uh, it's Onaka Transport Solutions. Hondo Onaka, uh, known from other media, not been in any of the movies, is like Clone Wars and Rebels. Um, he wants you to fly the Falcon, and he tells you the story of how Chewbacca is letting him borrow it for this job, and Chewbacca gets stuff for the Resistance, and he gets the profits, and you get profits too, and you're working for him. Um, and so you walk through this queue, uh, and then you get into this boarding area and you hear the Falcon take off from where it's at and you see it behind you come and land. And then you go down the jetway that feels like you're boarding a plane. 
Um, and then you go in through one of the docking tubes on the side, and you're suddenly in the Falcon. Like, you are in the Millennium Falcon to the point where you see the Dajaric table. Um, you see, like, it, you're just in the Falcon, and it's so cool. And then uh, they give you these roles, um, pilot, gunner, and engineer, and they all have different roles within the ride. And I thought the design of the ride was really interesting and fascinating. And also the way they are sort of, uh, the, the way they board. So they have, um, let's see if I can find a picture of it, but there's this, there's like three separate docking areas that have rotating cockpits that um, will let you out in one place and it all feels really seamless. Oh, wow. Like, it's I'll, I'll show you offline. It's really cool. Um, but at no time did I feel like I was not in the Falcon. Like, I was in the Falcon with a bunch of other parties and then they call us up and they say, okay, you're up. And uh, the friends who I was with kind of knew that it was really important to me. So they gave me the co-pilot seat, which controls up and down motion, motion as well as the hyperdrive lever. Oh, wow. That's wild. And uh, so there's a moment where I get in and I sit down and like this is the first moment where I kind of realized what was happening. And so I sat down in the co-pilot seat and I'm there and he's asking for a flight check and so you have to hit a couple buttons on the console and you can hear the falcon like revving up as you're hitting these buttons and i just sit there in the seat and i go oh my god 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 in star wars and like i start like literally freaking out like i'm about to pilot the falcon yep you about to and fly so this thing out of here my friend has the foresight to take a picture of me <laughs> <laughs> and that's the picture i'm showing you right now where like i was just freaking out in this moment uh, to the point where she couldn't get a good picture of me, but it so perfectly encapsulates how I was feeling in that moment. Absolutely. And so I love this picture, even though my face is blurred. You can clearly see a smile on my face, and it's just like I'm in heaven in this moment. Like, And I guess in the uh, picture, you can actually see some of the, the green lights that highlight the buttons that you're supposed to press. Nice. There's green highlights around them, so that way there's never any ambiguity about what you need to do. Um, so... The first time I was there, I was just controlling front and or up and down, uh, which the entire time, you know, I was just focused on the thing, so I didn't really get to enjoy the ride. The second time I was the gunner, which is one seat back, uh, and they basically control the guns. Um, and just the design of this ride, you can, like, really mess yourself up and owe credits, or they can give you credits if you do really well. Both times we did okay. Um, you know, and, and the people that were with us... Uh, it was really funny. So we, we went on and these people did nothing the first time. And then we got paired up with the same people the second time we went on hours later. Oh, no. That, what and are the like, chances of yeah, that? Yeah, right? That's wild. Never tell me the odds. Yeah. And like, it was, yeah, it was wild. Uh, and they were like, okay, we'll really try this time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll really give it a shot this go. And uh, we did better. So it was, cool, it was fun. It was fun. Um, and then we get off. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, so that was one moment that I freaked out. The other moment was um, as we were leaving... Uh, you know, there was a moment where I was just kind of like, we, we were about to leave the park and I was sitting, I was like, I want to see the A-Wing, right? Because we had walked in past it and we were walking out that same way and we didn't really do a whole lot over there since that other ride isn't open yet. Uh, we stopped by the A-Wing and I uh, I just kind of pulled out my data pad and I said, I want to hack this A-Wing. I hacked it and it's, the engine started revving and it made the sounds and uh, you know, like made smoke come out of it and stuff. Like it was like getting ready to go. And I just had this moment where I turned around and I was just so giddy. I was like skipping along. Like I'm in Star Wars. Yeah, that's pretty uh, wild, man. And so overall, like the, the the moral of the story, it's incredibly immersive. I only had four hours. I guess we, we stayed a little bit longer. We stayed five hours because we wanted to see the fireworks over um, over the Falcon. And uh, yeah, so we stayed a little bit longer, but even five hours was not enough to live the life that I wanted to there. Um, so we're going to get annual passes next year uh, after baby's born and just go. Absolutely. At, like, once or twice a month. Yeah, that's the way to fly, <laughs> man. So like in the Falcon, when you're working with, you're basically working with a team, right? Yeah. To be able to complete w the mission that you have. Yes. So is it kind of centered around do, like interacting with your teammates? Or is it just like it pay attention be. to the green buttons that come up and do the do the things it's telling you specifically to do? It can be. So like, let's say we all go for my bachelor party. Sure, because that's what we're gonna do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, I will obviously have the co-pilot seat, so I'll be controlling up and down. 
uh, and maybe you get the pilot seat and you're controlling left and right. And I'll be like, okay, up and left. And then we'll control up and left. And then, um, you know, that you can coordinate. The more coordinated you are, the better your results. Um, but it's entirely possible to go in there with a bunch of randos and just kind of press buttons and just get away and do fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as long yeah. as they're not just sitting there doing nothing, it's, it's on rails and the entire ride will go. Uh, but like, how funny would that be if you just wouldn't take off if you didn't do the right things? Right. <laughs> just hanging out in the <laughs> hangar. So I will say though, the engineers that we had, the people that didn't do anything the first time, um, I mentioned the immersion piece of it. Like, so we, like, they, they're not repairing the shields, which is their job. So we got dinged up a lot. Uh, and so when we exited the Falcon, there was smoke and there were sparks uh, in the hallway oh, as we exited. Awesome. You know, panels were off the thing. Like it knew that we had an unsuccessful run as far as like that repair job. Um, it was really cool. And the second time, since they did better, there was less damage when we got out. It was noticeable. It was awesome. There you go. That's sick. It was really neat. Uh, and I had a great time. And if any of you are Star Wars fans, uh, I highly recommend going. And I can't believe we're like halfway through the show already without even getting <laughs> to uh, this part. <laughs> it's Human Factors News. This is the part of the show where we break down everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, uh, privacy, security, robots, whatever it is, as long as it pertains to the field of Human Factors. It is fair game for us to talk about. Star Wars. And uh, you know what? I just want to say, like, thank you all for that long digression. I needed that. And... <laughs> Hopefully it was uh, entertaining and useful, and hopefully I brought it back to Human Factors enough for you to be interested in it. Um, I think it was all of the above. I'm sorry I'm a total nerd, but man, I just I needed to talk about it with people that understand what's going on. I clearly the soundboard not working. Okay, Blake, what do we have up first this week? Let's actually talk some human factors. All right. Stuff. So up first, so researchers have come up with a mobile sensing system that can track and rate the performance of workers by combining a smartphone, fitness bracelets, and a custom app. So the mobile sensing system is able to classify both high and low performing workers. And this this has been used by teams to actually track and systematically track over 750 US workers for an entire year. So the system was able to tell the difference between high performers and low performers with an 80% accuracy. And the aim of this product and research as a whole is to give employees insight into both physical, emotional, and behavioral well-being. But that constant flow of data also has a downside, and if abused, can put employees under constant surveillance by companies they work for. So research with this concept has found that higher performers typically had lower rates of phone usage and had longer periods mm. of deep sleep and were more physically active. So the researchers argued that this technology could provide a more objective measure of performance than self-evaluations and interviews, which are definitely and can be unreliable. So I don't know, Nick, we talked a little bit about this a couple, it's gotta be a month ago, at least now with the self checkout. Um, yeah, with the self checkout. And then again with, you know, Amazon using algorithms yeah. to basically hire and fire its workers. Uh, which was not the case, and I just clickbaited the title of that. But yeah. it's the same kind of concept. Like you're constantly monitoring people with, in this case, with really high fidelity, right? Like it's not just through a smartphone and tracking location and video cameras. It's even getting down to what are they doing at home? How are they sleeping? Because it's connected to their, you know, fitness bracelets. So this is this is taking it a step further outside of the actual company itself. Ah. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> Nick is oh, so excited God. about this one. I just, it's like, oh, uh, it feels like uh, this is, uh, and I feel like such a hypocrite because on the show, I, I often say like, yeah, I'm totally fine with people collecting data on me, but this feels like a bridge too far. Yeah, this has gone too far. Uh, I, think. I, I mean, like the performance aspect of it, like there's always this issue with performance where if you know you're being watched and monitored, you perform worse in some cases, right? In some cases, yeah. Uh, and so why would you want to set your employees up for failure in, in that situation? And maybe it's just like human observers. I don't know enough about the domain. But I don't know. Like, I There's something uneasy about me. Like, I don't know. How do you feel about so this? So I'll play devil's advocate <laughs> play here. Devil's advocate I think here. that it could be super useful if the company's, you know, if the company's desire is to really 
understand its employee employees at a deeper level than just are you a good worker or are you a bad worker? This is more so of taking into account like, okay, maybe you're not performing well, but we've seen you perform really highly for, you know, five years and all of a sudden you're doing really bad and we're noticing X, Y, and Z variables are impacting you and we're worried about your overall well-being. Like, what is there some event going on in your life that we don't know about? Is there something we can do as a company to help you? The part that mm-hmm. I don't really know what to do or think about is if they're monitoring, and this this is tip for tech because I love monitoring all of this stuff, right? So I like the heart fluctuations, sleep, stress, body, you. my own you. stuff. But if an employer came to me and noticed that there was a dip in my performance because I'm not getting up enough sleep and they start you know, recommending me to do something different or change my diet or whatever, I feel like I would meet that with a lot of aggressive yeah. kind of pushback. Yeah. So- it, I don't really know, man. I understand the need to under, to know, like, how, how are your workers performing? But I, I think with all this behavioral data and getting really into their emotional well-being, I think that's too much. Look, okay, so <clears throat> it's, it's attaching the data to the individual. I think that's the issue, right? So a couple years ago, there was an incentive at a large gaming company here in Irvine, um, that gave all their employees uh, Fitbits with the stip- for free with the stipulation that their data is owned by the company. Yeah. And uh, in that clause, they were aggregating data to understand um, that generally how active their employees were, uh, whether or not they were using the facilities provided by this company, um, and, and that kind of thing. So, so... That's one thing, right? When it's when it's aggregated, when it's de-identified, that's one thing. But it sounds like this one, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like this one is like looking at um, the individuals and and like you said, determining performance and uh, you know uh, making suggestions ba- or or I guess the making suggestions based on it is kind of the extrapolation of the application here. But yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, so to be super clear, this is not implicating that that's what a company was doing. I mean, this is much more of a research project of gathering all the data together and trying to understand, like, okay, if somebody's low performing and there's, like, trends across people of, like, having more phone time, being less active, eating not so great, not sleeping very well, maybe that's perf- that's leading to low performance. And what can we do for a larger group? This isn't necessarily, de- like, identifying one specific person like Blake you need to sleep better and these are the things you should do well you do you should yeah you, I probably you should. should but that's that's my <laughs> choice right but uh, I think what it's really what really irks me here in this entire situation is okay the physical data aside what happens if they're monitoring your like productivity at work and it's not scaled to your job correctly like if you do something like software development Right. And maybe half of your day is spent Googling and thinking and like writing stuff down. Whereas you're, if you're designing software or you're a project manager, your workflow is going to look completely right. different. And if you, if you've got, you know, either an algorithm that's not trained correctly or isn't trained fully, or you've got right. people monitoring what you're doing and they don't really understand the scope of the job, you could be misrepresenting, you know, how well people are actually doing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of conditional um, situations where, I don't know, man, like, uh, well, I, I'm just thinking about my own use, right? There's often times where I have to take off my fitness tracker uh, to go into certain spaces. I have to, uh, I, I don't get um, cell phone access for a good portion of the day some days. Um, uh, they're doing construction Next door. So right, next if door. You, if you hear any like weird things, it's not us uh, you know, passing gas over here. Usually we get away with it on Mondays, but yeah, it must be is, like an early preparing for Tuesday. What is going on? Uh anyway, so yeah, I, I think like if, if you were to look at that, you'd be like, Wow, Nick didn't move for like five hours. When in reality I just didn't have my fitness tracker on. Like because I couldn't. Um or you know, he when he's in the office, he Googles a lot. Yeah, well, it's, it's exactly that, right? Like, I'm trying to find answers to questions that I have up here. And it's like, that might not uh, necessarily reflect well in, in certain algorithms, right? Yeah. Yeah, precisely. So I 
I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it. I got one more thing that I just don't particularly care for here, and it. You, I'm only bringing it up because you talked about the company in Irvine doing it. Um, the thing that freaks me out a little bit, it's one thing to give people like the fitness trackers outright and just for free or whatever and say, we're going to, these are what, this is what we're going to do with it. But in this case, it seems like they've suggested that they're actually providing more kinds of incentives, like off, something off of your insurance or yeah. stuff like that. And it's when you get into that thing that it's almost like, it's not quite saying you will wear this, but it's saying that the the benefits outweigh exact outweigh not doing it for you as like an employee. I just don't think that's necessarily fair. But again, it's it's a strange trade off of, you know, trying to have productive workers and trying to understand your your like work environment and people's privacy. And it's something we're gonna continually have to battle over the next, you know, forever, it seems like. Yeah. Well, why don't we get into something that could empower us? Let's do it. All right. So soon you might not need anything more specialized than a readily accessible touchscreen device and any existing data sets you have to access you have access to in order to build powerful prediction tools. So a new experiment from MIT and Brown University researchers have added a capability to their North Star interactive data system that can instantly generate machine learning models. So to use with their existing data sets and in order to generate useful predictions. So one example is the researchers provide provided doctors could make use of a, make use of the system to make predictions about the likelihood of their patients having a con, having contracted a specific disease based on their medical history or they suggest a business owner could use their historical sales data to develop more accurate forecasts quickly and without a ton of manual analytics work so researchers are calling this feature the north star systems virtual data scientists and it sounds like it could replace the actual human equivalent especially in settings where one would never actually be readily available or resourced anyway to a company so this has wide-reaching implications for just as a whole adding these kind of you know machine learning powered systems into the hands of almost anybody yeah i look yes um this is cool and i think one of the last safe jobs was like data science because you need to make sense of data. And now AI is trained to analyze that data and make predictions for you. Nobody's safe. Ain't nobody safe. Uh, not even human factors, people, because they're going to they're gonna take this type of thing and be like, oh, we can provide design recommendations based on successful uh, interfaces. And we can run and multivariate analysis on what a usability yeah, test might look like exactly. for A through F. We can automatically recruit people and run them through usability tests. We can. We'll just run through. AI through usability yeah. tests. We don't need people anymore. Exactly. Uh, no. So I look, look like this is really cool. Um, it's pretty wild from from my perspective. Like this is awesome. I love data, uh, and I would love to like just open up a um, a couple data sets, link them together, and say, "What you got for me, computer?" And then just kind of poke around and see what you got, because like some of the most what. <laughs> What? <laughs> Just see what you got. Well, because, well, like, honestly, like, some of the most fun is when you have uh, the data from a research study or something, and you're like, okay, I have my hypotheses, so I'm looking for certain things, but what can surprise me about this? Um, and it might just do a bunch of analyses that return statistical significance, or it might give you uh, some graphs that you might not have thought to look at and go, wow, that's interesting, and sort of, you know, spark new ideas for research or um or even facilitate some of those those uh those medial tasks uh, that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis you know yeah i love the idea that it's just strikes out so much manual analytics work and in the kind of in the medical setting the option that it provided was this is something that maybe you know just looking through somebody's medical history you know visually wouldn't give you you would have to really have a very in-depth knowledge of who the person was and all that kind of stuff. And it, you're very unlikely to have that nowadays with the amount of people that doctor, doctors see and how much time they actually spend with patients. This could cut down some of some of that computing time and maybe give more accurate you know, representations of what people may contract or may have or what symptoms really may be indicative of. Yeah. And I mean, like... Uh... You know, we, we've talked a lot about giving doctors access to, like, your fitness tracker data and the dangers of that. But if you could see it all plotted on a graph and be like, 
just ask a couple follow-up questions like how often do you wear this oh, i wear it every day except for like 10 minutes in the morning when i charge it um then they'd be able to say like wow like I, i'm really pulling out some trends here and uh that might be kind of useful especially if they're trying to diagnose a problem that they might not know um or maybe the ai can just do that in the future you know that's like that. true like I, I wonder like pulling on the predictive thread if if let's say in your family history you i don't know somebody has cardiac disease like that's a likely thing to happen but if you look at your the trend of your own data you're unlikely to get it based off of you know your your activity levels in your fitness tracker or if you've been diligent by using like some app like my fitness pal and tracking your food intake um, and all the macros that you use, you're unlikely to have, you know, clogged arteries or whatever it may be. I feel like there's there's so much power in data, but there's so much danger in the privacy that we're going to stop having from it. Um, but I don't know, man. This is a pretty cool application of all the data that we have. Yeah, they did look at this on 300 real world data sets, which is really interesting. So it's like um, they've validated this against actual data. And I like, can you imagine like, just some of the applicant, like, man, I always like had this pipe dream and this is like, I don't know. It, it, it's a pipe dream of linking all known data sets together by some uniform variable, like date or something like my fitness data and your fitness data on this date, uh, tied with the temperature of that date, tied with, the economy of that date tied with other things of that date and maybe something interesting and weird would come out of that be like i feel like that's very possible in the world we're about to be living in like oh wow nick and blake were both more active on this day is it because of the weather well, i mean it was the economic climate it was hot so maybe not was it yeah was it the economic climate was it something going on right was it like, like there's just a ton of different things if you link together every single data set in the world. And I know that's absolutely ridiculous. Like I said, it's a pipe dream. Well, it could. Fit. The first thing that comes to mind in this, I obviously watch too many cop dramas, but that's the first thing I think of is like that's a way to solve, you know, where people were and what people were doing. Sure. Like trend analysis almost of like yeah. on days and times. These five people that I think are suspects, like here is some commonalities that I'm seeing with either the victim or across the people that I'm looking at. I don't know. I feel like that would be amazing and insane at the yeah. same time. Or like GPS data. Uh, so like if you were to be able to filter data sets by GPS data. So like because it's fresh in my mind, like Disneyland could be like, wow, on this day, people didn't really walk around all that much. They just kind of went in and sat down and didn't do much. And Or that could like, like give you an idea of what you could yeah. change, right? Like people just don't go this interact pathway, with this thing. This pathway was really uh, congested at this time of day. Like how can we, w what other ways can we alleviate pathways? Like, yeah, there's a lot of things companies like that could do to help facilitate better interactions with uh, the people using their products. And it's this whole cycle of, yeah, they're doing that to get more money out of you, but it's also more convenient for you. It's that trade-off. You're giving them data or they're taking data to give you something that's more convenient that will make you want to spend more money. And it's this whole cycle. But, like, man, I want, I want a data set like that. And combined with the power of this type of system where you're looking at, like, AI-driven analyses... Well, I've seen some like some Disney engineer sitting in a control room somewhere that's related only to Galaxy's Edge, just monitoring people's walking patterns through the park right. over the past couple of days. And they realized that at this specific time, Area X gets just unfathomably packed with people. We mm -hmm. should start having, you know, in park events that start draw to see if we can draw people off from this Pacific yeah. path later in the let's, day. Let's have like a show over by the resistance base to pull people over at a certain time. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It, I don't know. I mean, the that's, and that's a fun application, right? Yeah. Um, there's more sinister. Applications. And I'm sure, yeah, there's, there definitely is some more sinister applications, but that's like tying it back to what we talked about earlier. Just let's keep the, it's keeping the immersion alive because I mean, once you, once you're in Star Wars and it's packed with people, you start losing a little bit of it. You can get stressed out with the amount of people that are around or whatever. But if yeah. there's way, like sneaky ways that you can keep immersion going, keep people focused on the experience they're having through, you know, massive, powerful data analysis like this, it'd be insane. Oh, my God. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, the applications of this are endless. I'm excited to see what comes. I want my AI superpowers. Okay, we'll be back to break the rest of the news story. I guess one more news story <laughs> right after this. 
Nope, nope, nope. It's been a couple. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Nope. 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 <laughs> Just had to press it twice in a row. No, oh my God. that's not it. Do it <laughs> nope, again. Nope. <laughs> so good. Uh, well, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch, Stat News, and Science Alert for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. Slack is probably the best place to go because we do get some commentary on that, some back and forth. Uh, it's always fun to hear what you guys think of these stories, and we post those as we find them. All right, Blake, we got one more up this week. Uh, what do we have? All right. So when the heart stops beating, there's little time to waste. And half the people that are hit by cardiac arrest are outside of a hospital and more than 90 percent of them die unless they are lucky enough to be near a bystander who can perform or start CPR, CPR and call 911. But what if the bystander was a smartphone or a digital assistant like Amazon's Alexa? Well, researchers from the University of Washington tested that idea, training their digital tool to be alert to such such gasping sounds that half the people make shortly after cardiac arrest sets in. So having something that could potentially passively identify cardiac arrest without having to wear something extra on your wrist or be connected to a monitor is super exciting. So the machine learning model was actually tested and trained to classify agnogonal breathing. So this is the breathing that sets in right when cardiac arrest is happening using Amazon's Alexa iPhone 5S and Samsung Galaxy S4. So from six meters away, larger than the average bedroom, the tool was able to detect agnog agnogonal breathing events 90% of the time. So Nick, this is pretty nuts in the fact that we're getting away from having to have anything extra outside of the smartphone that most people carry every day to help maybe save your life. Yeah, that's cool. It might be. Uh, maybe. So the 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 um biggest issue here is is you know you're gasping and breathing. Is that a wake word now? Um, we all know that device is listening all the time. All of them are always listening all yeah. the time. But it's not supposed to collect data on you until you say the wake word. Um, and something like this, it's like. Is it passively listening for that stuff and the wake word? And then once it starts to understand more contextual cues, um, right now it's being used, or in this context, it's being used in a way to save your life. Um, but what are some other more innocuous cues that it could listen for that might be an invasion of privacy? Yeah, I'm, I feel like there's kind of a few things that are a little bit weird here. Because, I mean, okay, it identifies you might be having cardiac arrest. It can call 911. But if that's the situation, you still need to get CPR within X amount of minutes. And that may not be able to save your life. But it may be able to get you closer to it. Um, at the same time, I mean, what if... I don't know about you, the smartphone assistant that I use. I am consistently setting her off on accident at the most random serious? times. Yeah. Every time I do that, or if I say something even remotely close, uh, it'll kick off. So, I mean, what what is the false positive for this looks like? I know the article talks a little bit about that it's it's pretty reasonable because they were worried about, like, if this thing's listening to you sleeping, and if you're like me and you snore really loud, could it think that you're having cardiac arrest and, you know, the right. EMTs at your house in 20 minutes? Um, so, I mean, there there is that problem. I just I think it's a cool idea, uh, but the privacy concerns just never stop, right? Yeah, because I mean, what do you? I mean, that just means that more services and applications are going to start listening for different things, 
and being able to record them until you're basically recording every sound interaction that comes to your phone. Yeah, I, I do want to bring up a couple points that this article from Stat News explicitly points out. Uh, you know, no data is sent to the cloud, apparently, with this type of thing. Um, after a few seconds, all your data will be purged. I don't know who's handling that, uh, and that's nice to know that that health data is being purged. Um, I also wouldn't want it to be used against you. Like, let's say there's uh, some uh, medical supplies that you can use to help recover from something like this that then show up in your suggestions on uh, a certain platform. Target that advertising, yeah. May or may not be using in home listening devices. Like, um, the, uh, the, let's see here. Who is this? So, uh, one account here, Bot, I guess, is the person who um, is one of the lead researchers on this. Is that right? Uh, they say privacy is not an issue because they're willing to trade privacy for uh, the chance to save their life. So um, there's that. Yeah, Bot is the uh, executive director of interventional cardiovascular programs at uh, Brigham. So... Yeah, I mean, it's it's always going to be a trade-off. It is yep. like in every article we've talked about this week, I feel like it's, do you, how much do you give somebody to determine if you're a productive worker or not versus how comfortable are you with your phone or Alexa listening to you to determine if you're going to have like a cardiac event or later down the line, maybe something else. Yeah, so so my question to you, Blake, would you take this as, as uh, we've described it today? Um, without any of the extra baggage that we said, you know, the, the slippery slope argument. Of... Yeah, I wouldn't see why not, because, I mean, I don't know. Personally, I don't know that it would save my life if I was having a cardiac event and it caught on to it. What if you had a drone with... A, like a medical AED, supply drone? A medical supply drone yeah. with an AED in your house that could identify your body uh, and apply the AED? I mean, that's fine. That would be awesome! Yeah. That it, would be so cool. That's not even that far out of reach, right? No, I can totally see that happening. It's like a Roomba that just uh, maps your house. Just zooms out real quick. Knows gives exactly. Gives you a shock, goes yeah. back to your closet. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be so cool. Because we've seen medical drones before in the UK. That have dropped it. But the application of one would be a little different, right? It would have to hover over your body, make sure you're positioned in the correct way, right? Like yeah. face up. Um and make sure it can get to your chest, right? And, like, there's a lot of things that have to happen. It just needs to be a transformer. Right. Turn into a humanoid and do all the things it needs to do. Yeah, but I feel like having something like that around your house would give you some peace of mind, especially if you're prone to these types of medical... Yeah, as you uh, get older, right? Yeah, for sure. I don't know. Would you uh, well, Would you download the app or t subscribe to the service that sure. did this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I guess that, that uh, argument is pretty con uh, convincing, right? I... I would take the loss of privacy so that I could live. Like, why I, not? Yeah. What do you have to lose? Uh, I already have a device in my home, so if it can call nine one one for me and hopefully get first responders quick, you know, like fix. Well, it's just like the stuff that I'm sure my my phone is recording at all times. It it pales in comparison to something like this taking in my breathing and making assumptions based off of it. Yeah, and if it miscategorizes it, are you then charged for? The uh, charge for services rendered. Yeah, but that's the American healthcare system, and that's a whole other argument. Nope, 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 nope. It came from. There it is. It came from. You know I'm doing it on purpose now. Absolutely, I, yeah. yes. It. it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit is fair game as long as it pertains to the field of human factors. Uh, all right, Blake, we got time for one. So I think I'm going to take the one from Human Factor subreddit. Yes, there's never anything in there. Yeah, so there's, excited. There's never anything in there, and we need we need more people to write in that Reddit or write us directly. Uh, show at humanfactorscast.com. We're happy to answer listener feedback over Reddit feedback because it is a, a more direct link to the people who are listening to the show. All right, so this one here is posted on the Human Factor subreddit um, by... Uh, da, 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 I W X N G. There's uh, there's no way I could pronounce that. I whizzing. Yeah, I I that's my I that's my best guess. I whizzing. Uh, this one is titled "Junior HFE First Day." Um, they go on to write, "I've landed my first job as a junior HFE for a medical company!" Exclamation point. Congratulations! I'm excited for you. Uh, I've just finished university. Haven't even graduated yet, and this is my first big job. I was wondering what to expect as a junior. 
I have my job description and role, but I was wondering if anyone had any firsthand experience. Uh, well, there is. Um, I don't think anyone's had firsthand experience. So with a with a new job. So I think Never. you're SOL. Uh, yeah. Oh, and if anyone has any book recommendations, especially for the medical sector of HFE, that would be appreciated. Thanks in advance. Okay, Blake, two questions. One, have you ever started as a junior HFE for a medical company? I have not. Have you ever started as a junior HFE? Yes, I have. Okay, let's start there. There we go. Man, I would just be prepared for an overwhelming fire hose of information. Boom. That's it. That is the biggest thing. Just be ready and don't let yourself be overwhelmed by it for sure. Because it can be. Because you can, I don't know, people start hammering you with, especially in the medical field and a lot in like a lot of other fields, of course, there is some serious jargon going on. Yeah. And you may, in this case, you may be interacting with people that are not just human factors related. Maybe you're interacting with doctors, maybe you have product managers, maybe you're interacting with developers or, you know, people that are creating hardware. A whole swath of folks. So just be ready and willing to listen i think just take it all in especially on your first day or even your first like three months there just be an active listener taking everything in be ready and willing yeah i i would uh second your recommendation there blake um kind of brace yourself take lots of notes uh i think it's important to show that visibility that you are willing to learn um with with that fire hose of information uh i, I will say here um, you know, the job description and role don't necessarily uh, inform you of what you're going to be doing on the job. And hopefully you got some insight into what you would actually be doing in the interview process. That is your time to ask what, you know, the job actually is like, because um, that's as much as an, an interview of the company for you as it is for the company to interview you as a fit for that company. So um, that's just a tip to anyone who may be looking for their first job. Be sure to interview the company to see like what it is exactly you would be doing. Uh, book recommendations. I see you pulled up a few here, Blake. Yeah, so one that has come heck heavily recommended to me before when I was interested in health human factors is a book book by Decker called Patient Safety: A Human Factors Approach. So that it's this is kind of all about you know errors in the operating room and along with you know so how do you test for a user device error and that kind of stuff and methods for reducing user error with medical devices. Um, and one more thing to piggyback on the, the original question and kind of like my extended answer to it is you're going to get a lot of information, but don't be afraid to ask a whole lot of questions because if you don't, you're just going to feel very confused and it may come out later on that you just really didn't ask enough. Um, so yes. asking a lot of questions and really not being afraid to feel like uh, this maybe this is dumb. No question is dumb when you don't really know what's going on yet. Yes, uh, I will. I'm going to cheat here and go on to Reddit and read a couple of these recommendations, too, because it's always important to get other people's perspectives because we're just two people. Uh, there's let's see here. Usability testing of medical devices. Um, and forgive me, Blake, if these are any of the ones that you just said. Writing human factors, plans and reports. Write root, them. Root cause analysis and also moderating usability tests. Um, so those are a couple of references, and I think those are pretty... That's pretty standard. Yeah, that could be that could be applied to anything, not just medical, although the testing of medical devices, uh, that could be an interesting supplemental read for those of you who are not going into the medical field. So uh, anyway, I think... Uh, got anything else to add? That's all I got, man. All right. Nope. Nope. There we go. And there's the outro. There's the outro. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today uh, and dealing with my 30-minute rant of... Not rant. It was a 30-minute recollection of Galaxy's Edge. There it uh, is. Let us know what you guys think of that. Did, did you like my... Uh, I, Your soiree down memory lane? Yeah. Well, well, I don't even know what to call it. Did you like that? Did you hate it? Did you like the stories? I don't know. There wasn't a whole lot for us to talk about. Uh, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over our social channels at Attractors Podcast. If you want to write in and uh, bypass the Reddit line, that's uh, show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, we're always adding new stuff to Patreon, so uh, you, you know what? And you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you? They want to talk about medical drones that transform. 
If you want to talk about transforming medical drones, you can find me anywhere across social media at Don't Panic UX. Special thanks to Jeff Olson each and every week for video editing. Uh, as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, in Batu, we say Till the Spire. But on Human Factors Cast, we say It, it Depends! depends.